Welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions on missions, theology, and practice to help goers think and thinkers go. I'm Alex Kochman, your host, and this week we're taking a break from our normal interview routine to present you with something a little bit different. Uh, In the missions world, we're constantly coming back to the idea of calling. And it's a critical area where our theology can inform and correct what we tend to think about this topic, calling by default. So you're about to hear a talk that I delivered to our local chapter of the C.S. Lewis Institute on the topic of calling of vocation. And we think it's ripe with implications for missions. But before we dive in, remember that the best way that you can express your support for the show is by leaving a positive rating and review. That'll get this content in front of others who can be blessed by it. Now then, enjoy the show. So the text where we'll be today is 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 9 and 10. The prompt, the topic, is pursuing God's call on your life. That's what I was asked to talk about. And I don't know if you've noticed, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but Neil's not in the room, so I'll just go for it. (laughs) Sometimes when I look at the topics and the scriptures, the passages that are given for each C.S. Lewis lecture, I look at it and I'm like, is that directly connected to the text? And in this case... I think the text is connected to the topic of pursuing God's call, um, but what I want to do is take a little bit of time to get there. Because I think it's there, but I think it's downstream. And so I want to take kind of that lazy river ride all the way through the text to the implications of that text uh, on something like calling. And for those of you who didn't have the misfortune of hearing me speak multiple times already this week, um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Um, My name is Alex Kochman, and uh, you heard a little bit about my background from Neil. Uh, But I do have the pleasure of serving at ABWE, which is a global missions agency. We have about 1,200 personnel worldwide reaching 84 countries. Um, And it's it's a privilege. I'm sorry? ABWE, Association of Baptists for World Evangelism. And so we are an evangelism, discipleship, and church planting missions agency, uh, doing that across the world through church planting teams uh, that are using a variety of platforms from medical ministry, building businesses in their communities to build relationships, preach the gospel, and train nationals to take over those churches. And we've existed for 94 years. And uh, we would also ask, pray for our teams that just evacuated Ukraine. We've had a long-standing presence there And currently we have several that are themselves uh, either refugees or working with refugees in neighboring countries throughout Eastern Europe. Uh, So it's a privilege serving in that way. And because of that, the topic of calling comes up pretty often. I used to work on our mobilization side, our our mobilization ministry, along with Pat. And that's a topic that often uh, would get discussed is, am I called to become a missionary? And this idea of calling, I think there's as many wrong ideas of it as there are true ideas of it. Uh, When I was in uh, my biblical studies program, when I was in my undergraduate, you meet other people there who, you know, in undergrad, especially in a big Christian college university setting, there's people that are there because it's high school part two. There's people there that are are more serious about their studies. And for those that are preparing for uh, the the Bible or the seminary track, there's this sense of you you meet some of them, uh, especially especially in parts of the South. Right. My my daddy was a preacher. My granddaddy was a preacher. My great grand daddy, you know, was, was born on the altar at church, right? And, and so I'm here to become a preacher. And God told me when I was five years old, I responded to the altar call and he said, you're going to be a preacher, right? And I had classmates like that. And I never understood that. I never felt that way. Well, God didn't tell me verbally anything when I was five, um, especially about preaching. And so there, there is, a, I think, a sense of inadequacy that we can feel when someone comes and maybe speaks at your church, and maybe it's a pastor, maybe it's a missionary, right? And, and they have a very clear sense of calling, a very clear sense of mission. And then for others of us, it's like, well, I, I guess this is what I'm doing, you know, whatever my station is in life. And we have a little bit less developed a sense of this is my calling from God. I think part of the reason is because we suffer from thinking that there are three wills in God three wills in God or three types of calling, three types of plan. Uh, And and I'm going to suggest that only two of them are biblical. First, we know that God has a sovereign will because God is sovereign over all that comes to pass, all whatsoever that comes to pass. His secret decree that we don't know. We don't know his unfolding plan for history, but we know that he's meticulously sovereign over every molecule 
of the universe. And Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord. The things that he's revealed to us belong to us and our children to obey them. And so we also know that in addition to this secret unfolding sovereign decree and plan of God, uh, that we can only know in retrospect, looking back at history, that there's also the revealed will of God, the moral will of God, his will of precept, his will of command. Thou shalt not murder. That is a command. And we know that these two wills, his sovereign will and his moral will, uh, intersect and interplay in interesting ways at times. Look no further than the cross. Because on the one hand, God had decreed before the foundation of the earth that, that the lamb would suffer and die for the sins of his people. And at the same time in his moral will, it also says, do not murder. And somehow these things come together, that he doesn't will for people to murder, and yet he will for that to take place, right? And so we live in that tension between God's moral will, his commands, and his sovereign will. But then there's this third will that many of us, I think, embrace. And that's the idea of this individual will that doesn't quite fit into either category. By the way, these categories come from Gary Friesen, his book, Decision Making and the Will of God. Highly recommend uh, that book. I think it's been out for about 30 years. What he discusses in that book is this individual will, this idea of, well, it's, it's kind of God's sovereign will because it, it precedes me. I didn't choose it. God chooses it for me. Uh, he has this plan for me in my life. And it's, it's kind of also God's moral will, though, because I have to obey it. I have to follow it. I have to seek it out. I have to learn about it. But it's not clear. It's, it's like an Easter egg that I've got to hunt for. And often how this comes out is questions that, that I heard a lot as an undergraduate that you often hear among young people, but who do I marry? What job am I supposed to take? Where am I supposed to live? Those sorts of questions and the idea that, well, I've got to discover the perfect Easter egg out there that is God's best will, best plan for me. And if I, if I don't perfectly identify that, then I'm in sin or I'm not living up to God's fullest potential for my life. And there is truth in the fact that God gives us wisdom, gives us discernment, gives us direction, and can even prompt us in sometimes extraordinary ways through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but can also be crippling. And I think part of the problem of this third category of, of this individual will that, that we've adopted, and I say that for lack of a better term, but part of the problem is it's, it's a very modern parochial problem. In the Middle Ages, we just sang, a mighty fortress is our God. So think about the, the day and age in which Martin Luther lived. In that period of time, your vocation is determined by where you're born, your slot in life. Your father's field is your field, right? You don't ask, what am I going to be when I grow up? Well, you're going to be a subsistence peasant farmer or something like that, right? And for the women, their lot in life was determined. And so modernity has kind of opened up to us this whole range of options, and we get analysis paralysis. We have the privilege, or maybe it's a curse, of trying to figure out some of these things. And what I just want to show you in this passage and suggest to you is that looking at texts like 1 Peter 2 and other places that, uh, well, Scripture doesn't discuss calling the way that we often discuss it. It doesn't discuss God's will and his plans for our lives the way that we assume that that kind of works in our modern age. And so I've got a few points, and here's uh, the first of them. And, and they're all grounded in this idea that you already received in your readings this week, which is that calling is first about who you are more than it's about what you do. We often rush to what you do. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to choose in my life? But it's more than anything about who you are first. And then by implication and application, it's about what you do. And that's going to sort of form the foundation of each of these ways of unpacking calling throughout Scripture. So knowing that calling is, is more about who we are, uh, I want to put it this way. First, calling is soteriological first and vocational second. It's soteriological first, soteriological meaning with reference to salvation. It has to do with salvation first and then vocation second. Of course, I'm playing with words there because vocation just means calling. But when we use the word vocation, we often mean a job, a, a profession, right? What we do from eight to five or seven to five or whatever your working hours are. Uh, but the work that we give ourselves to, it's soteriological first and vocational second. So in almost every case in scripture where calling is used, it refers to conversion. 
It refers to the salvation event, the initial salvation event in a believer's life. Sometimes it does refer to a ministry calling, a ministry vocation, a slot that you fill, a, a position, an office, a task that the Lord's given you. Uh, and sometimes it just refers to your current station in life, wherever you find yourself. And a few examples of that. First, you see it in our text, uh, which is 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 9. And it states halfway through that verse that God called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that's something that happened the moment they believed in Christ. They were being called out of darkness into light. There's more though. Romans chapter 1 verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So he was called to be an apostle. That's vocation. And yet he also says, a few verses later, verses six and seven, he's writing to you who are called of Jesus Christ, called as saints, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's this idea that you are called to be a saint. Paul's called to be an apostle, but you're just called to be a, to be a believer, to be one of his people. And then there's this other statement that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 7, 24. And there's an extended discussion here. The whole chapter is worth reading, but he says, Brethren, each of you is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. In context, it's talking about if you were born a free man, don't seek to be a slave. If you were born a slave, don't seek to be free. Of course, he's not so much commenting on the political institution of slavery as it existed then, so much as the idea that whatever station you belong to in life, wherever you're born in life, Trusting God with that, that that's by design, that is your calling. If you were a welder when you became a Christian, Paul would suggest to you God's will for you, his calling is to be one, a Christian, and two, a welder. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because in that scenario, you are a Christian and a welder already. Hey, I just discovered God's will for my life. It's encouraging. So what does this all point us to? It's soteriological first, it's vocational second, it's about salvation first and job second. And because of that, I want to dwell on this point that secondly, calling is received, not constructed. Calling is received and not constructed. Something that we miss in our contemporary moment is the givenness of our identity. Identity from God as gift. And not to just bring us right into sort of thinking about culture war issues, because I know it's a Saturday morning and not all of us are fully caffeinated yet. <laughs> but look no further than what you see happening in the LGBT movement and the, the transgender controversies happening. And it's a rebellion against this idea that who you are, even down to a, a chromosomal level, is a gift. And see, we live in sort of this Gnostic paradigm where the physical doesn't matter. All that matters is the image of me that I construct with this device with all the ones and the zeros and the picture that I select, the filters that I can apply, right? The, the pronouns that I put with that. And I can basically be really anything. Uh, and the idea that not only does God tell you to live a certain way, and I think many of us think of biblical sexual standards along those lines as, well, God tells you to live this, this way. And it's true, there's law, there's command from God. But it's command in light of the fact that who you are itself is a gift. You've received that from someone else. It comes from outside of you. Instead, we try to, to construct who we are. It's the difference between mimesis and poesis. Two terms which, if you've read The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Carl Truman, I think several of you have read it, and it's very helpful. It is thick, and it's a little bit depressing because it's kind of a diagnostic of where we are right now as a people. So it's definitely not a happy book, but it's an insightful one, and this is one of the themes that he discusses. See, poesis being creating things, uh, ori being original. Right? In terms of your identity, wanting to be a, a completely original person versus mimesis, think of mimery, right? The idea of mimicry, uh, of imitation. And of course, God has created us to engage in poesis in a sense. We want to create, and God is a creator, but at the same time, we glorify God through imitation, don't we? We're made in his image. Everything that we're doing is imitating him, what he's given us, 
the world that he's put around us. And we take those things, we cultivate them, and we turn that into something beautiful and glorious that brings him glory again. And everything that we do about our identity is a type of mimicry. And one of the things that he traces through the book is how we got where we are. He talks about the fact that first through the psychological movement and psychoanalysis, and he traces some of these figures, but uh, first culturally in the West, we, we psychologized the self. We psychologized the self. Uh, we, we made who you are all about what's happening between your ears and your psyche. But then what we did is we sexualized the psyche. We sexualized the self. And now we're living in the politicization of that sexualization of the self. And you see, he sort of traces how now we have this, this sense of where we're all meant to be expressive individuals. And all we're supposed to do is really show the world who we are deep down inside. And that's very often caught up in who we are sexually or the desires that we have sexually. That's all caught up in, in my core identity. And my job, my calling, my lot in life is to express that and to really create that sort of from scratch. And how different is that from the biblical idea that we're created in the image of God? We don't image ourselves. That fundamentally who we are is meant to be a reflection of God's glory. And let's think about what that means and trace out some things that will become relevant, especially as we get into the text. So Adam had the image of God perfectly initially. He reflected God perfectly. And his vocation, his lot in life, the work that he was given, had to do with the fact that he held essentially a threefold office. And we talk about this being true of Christ, but this is certainly true in an initial sense of Adam, that he was a king, a prophet, and a priest. He was a prophet, a priest, and a king. In other words, he ruled on behalf of God. He spoke on behalf of God. And he brought the presence of God to God's world. And his goal was to spread the glory of God and turn all of the globe into a cultivated Eden. So he had this threefold office that he was given. And of course, after the fall into sin, that image and that calling is marred, right? And it's, it's broken, but it's not completely removed. Christ is the image of God. Christ is the second Adam. He's the second man, and because of that, he not only restores that image in his followers and his, in his people, he also restores those offices. And so Christ is the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. Of course, he's more than those things. He's also the divine son, but he is prophet, priest, and king. And yet, in a much lower sense, he calls us, in him, to act in kingly and prophetic and priestly ways. And that's what we'll get deeper into, into the text. And we'll just... Quick uh, preliminary note again, calling is soteriological first, vocational second. Second, calling is received and not constructed. And third, calling is objective and not subjective only. And again, this is another way of kind of getting at how we've lost this idea of what scripture means by calling. We think of it as just about me and what does God want me to do? And yet in scripture, it's not about discovering emotionally this impression of, well, where do I feel led in life? But when God calls, you can't miss it. God can speak in such a way as to be heard. And here's an example of this from Acts chapter 13. Many of you know this. This is the beginning of the first missionary movement. Now, there was an Antioch in the church uh, that there was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, it doesn't say someone got an impression. It doesn't say, well, I feel, feel this on my heart. But it says, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So in the missions agency where I serve, we talk about this text when we're working with individuals that sense a calling to missions, when we're working with pastors. Because how it works today is that a pastor preaches, an individual in the pews feels something, 
And then we wait for the individual in the pew to come to the pastor and say, well, I feel called. Will you give me money and let me go <laughs> out into the world on some sort of a mission? And then the pastors have to deliberate and, and oh, I don't want to be the bad guy. So I'll let the missions committee decide that they're not qualified. We're not going to you know, the budget. The budget just isn't set up this year. Wait, maybe next year we'll have more room in the budget. And this is so often what happens. It bubbles up from the bottom organically. And yet what happens, at least in this text, is that God calls in an objective, audible way the leadership, the elders of the church and the teachers and Paul the apostle. He calls the leadership of the church and says, hey, you send them out. Send out Paul and Barnabas. I am sending them. And they partner with God in that. In the Bible Fellowship Church that I'm a part of, uh, and Nancy, who's uh, one of our year two students, uh, we serve together in that church. And so grateful for Nancy. She'll be singing up there on stage with me tomorrow. In the arrangement of the Bible Fellowship Church, in our polity, uh, we refer to calling a pastor. So a pastor is called... A pastor, not just because he has his credentials, not just because he has a master's of divinity or any of those other things. He's called when the elders and the congregation together say, you come serve here. Right. And so there's a very objective sense to what calling means. Calling is not just sort of a feeling and it's not just bottom up. It's also top down. Uh, and yet the way we talk about calling is very emotional. Right. I feel called very different from this objective sense of calling. So there's a few more points that we'll get to, and this will come from the text itself. So if you're not already at the text, 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm actually going to read from verse 4 to set up some of the context here. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, for it stands in Scripture. Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And then our text, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so the, the final two points that will come out as we dive deeper into this passage are that calling is corporate and not purely individual. And that sort of speaks for itself in the text. There's, there's a corporate thing happening. It's God's people together are called to be something. It's not just about me and who I want to be in my life. And the final point that we'll see, I think, in the text plainly is that calling is missional. It's not necessarily clerical. So there's a mission, a ministry, a spiritual mission that we have doesn't necessarily mean you're in full-time vocational ministry, that you're clergy. Okay, and that's what we'll see, and we'll see other things in this text. And so since we've talked so much about what calling isn't, let's see what it is. And setting up this passage, the context of the book, Paul is writing to the exiles, the elect exiles, of the diaspora, the dispersion throughout Asia Minor. And so there's debate over whether it's a Jewish or a Gentile audience. Is he speaking literally to Jews as exiles or figuratively to Christians as exiles in the world? I think the best answer is yes. Uh, and I also happen to believe that it's mostly Jewish focus. He's speaking to Jewish believers, and I think there's clues towards that. But he's speaking to Jewish and Gentile believers that are in some way or another scattered. They don't have a home base. They don't have a, a temple that they're necessarily allowed to go to uh, and allowed to engage in, in Christian worship. And he's writing at this period of time where judgment on Jerusalem and the priesthood system there and everything that the Old Testament economy was about is about to be judged 
and removed convulsively. He's writing in the 50s and the, or, I might be wrong, 60s. And the temple was about to be destroyed in AD 70 at the hands of the Romans. So there's this 40 year period, sort of a baton handoff in a race between the Jewish age the Old Testament age and this New Covenant, New Testament age where there's, there's overlap, but that overlap is about to go away. Christians are coexisting in a world where there's still a Jewish temple with sacrifices, with feasts, with all of the things that the Old Testament prescribed, and that's about to be done away with. And so it's an interesting time because there's a, a lot of Jewishness in this text that we'll see here. And so Peter unpacks this fact that we got at earlier, which is that we are the covenant people of God called into kingly, priestly, and prophetic office in and through all of life. So who are the covenant people of God in this setting? Where the old things, the shadows, the types are about to be replaced with the substance of what it means to be in relation with God? Well, we are the covenant people of God. We are Israel, called into kingly, priestly, and prophetic service. And so he uses a bunch of metaphors, but we'll summarize them this way. We are stones, a nation of priests, and we are a nation of king, priests, and prophets. Stones, a nation, and a nation of prophets, priests, and kings. So living stones, verses four and five, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And he goes on from there. So this idea of being a stone for Peter is significant. Peter was called a stone. That's what the word Peter means. Simon Peter. Peter means stone or rock. We also know from scripture that the rock is God. God is our, our rock and our fortress, Psalm 19, 14, other places that God is a rock. And yet Jesus says, Peter, you're going to be a stone. So Peter and his, his confession of faith that he makes in Matthew chapter 18, 19, is foundational in that he serves as this foundation of the church, confessing the gospel, this apostolic faith. And the content of this faith is that Jesus is the stone that's rejected but precious. And he goes on from there and he says, he's laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That stone that the builders rejected, Peter is quoting Psalm 118. Jesus is the stone that's cast away by the builders and yet it becomes the head of the corner. And some are crushed by it, some trip over it, but others are built upon it and established, right? And we, because we are in Christ, are also stones. That's why he says in verse 4, as you come to him, and he is the living stone rejected by men, verse 5, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house. And so we are stones, corporately, together, together. Because calling, what we're called to be, is corporate, not just individual. We, like Christ, the living stone, are also living stones being built together into a temple, spiritually. Not a literal temple. The literal temple was about to be destroyed. But there's a better temple that he's pointing them towards. And it's us. We're being built together in this way. I think we have to check our hearts. If in all of our thoughts about what am I called to do for God... If that's all about me, my passions, my skills, my interests, my income, my place of residence, who are we forgetting? We're forgetting all of the other stones that make up this building. Whatever we're called to be for God, we're called to be for God together. And what does a temple do? Well, it serves as the place in which all of the priestly work happens. And so he also identifies us as a holy priesthood. And there's more that we'll see in verses 9 and 10 about that. But notice that here where he references the priesthood, there's a lot of things that priests do. He's focused on one of them here, and it's sacrifices. To be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So spiritual sacrifices, not just literal, physical, bloody sacrifices, but spiritual sacrifices. Think of what Hebrews 13, 15 says, the, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. 
Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, the New American Standard says. That's a spiritual sacrifice, our praise and our worship. Or how about what Romans 12, 1 and 2 say, that, that we are a living sacrifice, right? That we're supposed to render to him this acceptable form of worship and not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so these spiritual sacrifices are everything in life. It's not just being a pastor or a missionary or any of those things that we tend to place a higher value on. And I love the fact that it states here, these spiritual sacrifices are acceptable to God through how sincere I am. No, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I'm comforted, and I hope you are as well, by the fact that not only did Jesus die for my sins, he also died for my good deeds <laughs> because they need his atoning blood just as much as my overt sins do. There's as much mess and impurity in the things that I try to do for him as there is in the things that I do against him and still do against him. It's through Jesus that our works are purified. And this is what the Old Testament sacrificial system, by the way, was pointing to all along. This is why in the eternal state, the eternal kingdom, there is no temple, there's no sacrifices because Psalm 4, 5, offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. What is a right sacrifice? Faith. That's the right kind of sacrifice, even in the Old Testament. Or, or how about the statement in 1 Samuel 15, 22, that obedience is better than sacrifice. The spiritual sacrifice is acceptable to God. That is what God is calling us to render to him. And so you see already, though, that Peter is setting up this contrast between the Christian life and all of the types and shadows and forms of the Judaic system that's about to pass away. And then we read that we are a nation, verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And then in verse 10, you were not a people, now you are a people. You are now recipients of mercy as well, even though you weren't before. And so with every turn of phrase, there's another Old Testament scripture that he's referencing. And so if you have the ability to flip back and forth, if you're not on a mobile device, if you can flip quickly back and forth, turn to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, this is where Israel's at Sinai. They're about to receive the law. And Yahweh says this, now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for the earth is mine. And he goes on from there. Now, there's something beautiful here. What's beautiful is the fact that God was promising this people group, the Israelites, that they would be his treasured possession. That term, treasured possession, there's a scholar who makes note of the fact that that's not just referring to, hey, I like you more than other people, right? It's not purely that sense. It's the sense of covenant in that culture had a suzerain, a lord, and it had subjects that were joined to that covenant. If a suzerain conquered another territory, the people of that place became bound to that covenant lord in subjection. And that's similar to what's happening here, and yet... Love saturates all of this, and this term treasured possession is the idea that this particular people that belongs to him in covenant is to be a favored vassal or a representative. So think back to Abraham, right? When he picks Abram and his family, it's not just because he likes them the most. It's because they are to represent God to all the nations, Right? In you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And it's that same sense here. They are a treasured possession. They are the favored vassal, the spokesperson, subjected to God in covenant, yes, but subjected so that they can go out and be, well, priests and represent God to other people. But there's also something that's still beautiful, but perhaps less encouraging in Exodus 19.5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, what was that word in there? If. And we all know what happened. They did not continue in the covenant. 
That's why we're warned. And it says they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to. And the rejection of the Jews was not a surprise to God. It was foreordained by him. So Peter's setting up this context here, uh, this, this tension. There's Jews without their homeland. They're kicked out of the religious system. They're looking for identity. Well, we, Jews and Gentiles, followers of Christ, we are the new Israel. And that's what he's getting at in Exodus 19. In just the same way that God saved the people from Egypt so that they would represent him to the rest of the world, and they did. Think of all the times in the Old Testament when they did, right? When they're conquering Canaan, people are hearing about what happened and how they were delivered. And Rahab says, everyone is afraid of you, right? Everyone stands in the fear of you. Everyone knows what Israel's God did to Egypt. Or when they're established in the land and the Queen of Sheba comes to Solomon and, and all the nations are coming and figuring out what's, what's happening here on this little strip of land. There is a real God here doing incredible things. Well, the same way in which they were chosen and set apart to be a light to the nations, so are believers now in this age and in this covenant. And then he quotes Hosea chapter 1. I was actually at a uh, church service one time where they decided, well... Uh, it's Christmas, and at Christmas, everyone's expecting to hear about the baby Jesus. Everyone's expecting to hear about the nativity. So, uh, and we've got one chance for, you know, for, for many of these people. It's the only time they're going to be in church all year long. Uh, so let's not preach the gospel. Let's not mention the birth of Jesus. Let's preach on Hosea. <laughs> And the story of Hosea being called to marry Gomer, the prostitute, as a story of God's unrequited love for Israel. Merry Christmas. Well, it's not wrong. It's in Scripture. You can preach on it. But, you know, you could argue maybe you want to focus on the birth of Christ at Christmas. Anyway, we won't get into all of that. But uh, that was the text that we handled at that time. It's an interesting text that God takes one of his prophets and calls him to marry a prostitute and have children with her, knowing that she'll abandon him. And she does. And the names of those children are prophetic metaphors. And God instructs Hosea to name one of them Lo-Ami, which means not my people, and the other child Lo-Rahama, which means no mercy. Because these people are not my people, and I am not going to have mercy on them. It is a harsh, harsh message of judgment for the covenant people. And yet, in verses 10 and 11, and then again in chapter 2, all throughout chapter 2, he says, But I will again betroth her to me, and I will again bring these children back to me. And there's a reversal of the names of these children themselves. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I have called not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Of course, we know this happens through Christ. How else can God divorce and remarry a wayward people? How else can he disown and adopt sinful children? It's through the death and resurrection of Christ for sinners by which we're saved. So this is a promise not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles, that they got to be a part of this covenant people. And we know this because Peter's not the only one to quote it. Paul does too. Romans chapter 9, in his whole teaching on election and reprobation, he says, What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the object of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make known the riches of his glory to the objects of his mercy, which he prepared in advance for glory? So God is free to save some, free to not save others, free to show wrath, free to glorify and show mercy. Even us, he says, verse 24, whom he has also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. I will call her my beloved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. So what is our calling? We're the new Israel. We're prophets, priests, kings. And we have this priestly function again. So take a look at what it says. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood. And again, he quotes from Isaiah, excuse me, Exodus 19. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, if you're awake, notice Peter says, 
royal priesthood. Moses says kingdom of priests. He flips it. He reverses it. What, is Peter playing fast and loose? What is he doing here? This is Moses. You can't edit Moses. Well, it points us to a couple things. First of all, these offices overlap. And that's what we've been talking about up until this point, that that there are kingly, priestly, and prophetic functions, and and there's overlap between them. Uh, It is both. There's also the fact that there's a change in emphasis under the Old Covenant. It's a geopolitical kingdom, Israel. In the New Covenant, we are a spiritual people that transcends every nation, race, and tribe, and tongue. So the emphasis is not just on the political boundaries of a kingdom. The emphasis is more on the priestly function. We are royal, but we're priests in every kingdom, in every human political construct. And there's also a slight shift in emphasis between the Old Testament model, which was come and see what God's doing in these borders of this land, to, for us, it's go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Go and tell versus come and see. But we are priests. We're royal priests or kingly priests. And so what do we do with that? This is why I said earlier that this is corporate, not just individual. This is missional, not just for the clergy. We all have a priestly mission regardless of your profession from eight to five. For Israel to be a kingdom of priests meant that they were to bear Yahweh's name and they were to represent him to the rest of the world. Deuteronomy chapter 4, in the introduction to the law, do you remember what Moses says? See, as people saw them live out their relationship with Yahweh, they weren't supposed to look on at that law and that system and say, that is so oppressive, I cannot wait for Jesus to come, that seems like a lot of work. That was not necessarily what's going on there. Now, there is an element where the the law, yes, is a schoolmaster to teach us, to train us for Christ. Through the law, we know sin so that we come to Christ. But what Moses says is that they're going to look and say, "What, what nation has a God so near them to give them such good laws as these? This idea that God's law is good. And through his grace and the preaching of grace and the promise of the gospel and through his his laws and his way to live, they were supposed to show the world how good and gracious God is through law and gospel. And we do the same thing as priests. The priests brought God's presence to others. The priests mediated the presence of God as people came in approach to God. And the priests also had a function of teaching and instructing and training people in what God's word had to say. But then there's this other office. We've talked about kingship and priesthood. Haven't yet talked about this prophetic office, and that's where I want to kind of round things out. He says this, You're a chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim. That's a prophetic function, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So let me just draw your attention to a few things here over the next few minutes. First, the fact that we proclaim, I'll admit I fall very short in this area. We don't talk a lot today about proclaiming. We talk about sharing Christ, teaching, studying, uh, suggesting talk about sharing our testimony, telling our story, right? These are all euphemisms that we use, sharing our faith. The biblical word is to proclaim, right? We're not merely suggesting to people that there's a better way to live. We are heralding the good news of what God has done. That's a prophetic function. Whatever you do with with the gift of prophecy, and does that continue today or not, We are all prophets in the sense that we are all to herald and to proclaim someone's message that's not our own. It's someone else's word, and we're supposed to deliver it with force in an unadulterated way. It doesn't have to be on a soapbox. It can be over coffee, but there's a point even in personal relational evangelism where I shift from talking with the person to proclaiming to them, you should repent and believe and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died and rose. He calls you to come to him. Come. So we proclaim, and the content of what we proclaim is not just, here's how to be saved. It's not just, here's what God has done for us, for me, in my life, how he's changed me. 
Those are wonderful and good and important things to share, and we should tell others those things, but we proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We don't use the word excellencies too often. I don't call an employee into my office and say, I saw all of your excellencies this week. (laughs) Good job. Here's a gift card, right? This word excellencies, some translations might have virtues. That's another word that's forgotten, virtue. What is virtue? If you want to get nerdy and weird about language, virtue, uh, virtus in Latin, virtu, it's this idea of manliness, of what it means to be a fully formed man in terms of character. Think of a werewolf is a veer wolf. It is a man wolf, veer, virtus. So you learned something new. A, a, a werewolf is just a really virtuous wolf, but, <laughs> but it refers to a wolf that takes on the character traits of a man. And so this idea of virtue has to do with moral character. And the idea of virtue is connected with the idea of excellence. It's a similar idea. I love what Jonathan Edwards, America's great mind, says about excellencies. He prefers the word excellencies. He's got a a great piece called The Excellency of Christ. You can find it online for free. Give that a read, The Excellency of Christ. And his whole thing is that you see the virtues or the excellencies of Christ on display in these paradoxical contrasts. Here's what he says. Christ will give himself to you by faith with all those various excellencies that paradoxically meet together in him to your full and everlasting enjoyment. What does that mean? These paradoxes. So think of all the paradoxes or seeming paradoxes that are in Christ. Condescension down to our level and transcendence above all of reality, right? Wrath and also tender, merciful love all at once. Humanity and deity in one. Lowliness and majesty, right? Edwards, who's, who's all about enjoying God, all about apprehending the, the sweetness of God. He says, you do that through understanding these excellencies, that, that Christ alone is human and God, He's wrathful, and yet he's tender and merciful and loving and compassionate towards his children. That's what we proclaim. The virtues, the character, the excellencies, the attributes of God, not ourselves, not just what he has done for me, as wonderful as that is. So a lot of content here. Allow me to summarize briefly. My pastor at our church, Nancy will tell you this, and I give him a hard time too. All of his sermons are two points long. And we were, we were even talking about like changing up the length of our service the other day. And I said, well, you, you can't trim anything from the sermon because you would have one point and you can't have one point. Well, I apologize, but we've got several more points than that here. So just to retrace our ground, we talked about calling is soteriological first. It's vocational second. It's received as a gift. It's not built or constructed. It's objective It's not subjective and just something that I feel. It's corporate. We do it together. It's not just individual. And what is that calling? We are living stones being built up into a priesthood. We are a a nation. We are the covenant people of God. And as such, we are kings, we're priests, we're prophets proclaiming his excellencies and his virtues. And so because of that, we all have a mission. Our calling is to be on mission, not necessarily to be clergy, but to be on mission. So what's the point of all of this for our actual nine to five? We didn't really talk about that much, and yet we did, didn't we, right? Because I'm going to carry a completely different mindset into my eight to five if I'm there to represent an image Christ, knowing that I'm called from darkness into light to proclaim how excellent and virtuous that God who saved me is. And within that... You know what we've just done? We've just removed the third circle that didn't belong there all along. So we know God's sovereign plan to save us. We know his will of command, how he wants us to live. And that Easter egg of, well, but what's his secret will for my life? Well, should he providentially lead me and prompt me to do something extraordinary for him that's outside the norm of what I would normally think of? He is certainly free to do so. But I don't have to live in anxiety over figuring out what that little Easter egg is for my life, because I know I'm called to be a 
a member of this nation, a, a king, a priest, and a prophet proclaiming who he is, bringing his presence out into the world just like Israel did. And so I'm free to do that anywhere, in any job, in any station of life. And with that freedom comes the responsibility to steward it well. Yet I'm free from the shame that comes from figuring that I failed. I'm free from the anxiety that comes from worrying, did I take the right job? Well, I'm called to belong to him, and he's given me a mission. So let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you give us freedom to represent you in any station of life. Help us to do so faithfully. Forgive us for the times that we fail to proclaim your excellencies where what we proclaim is ourselves and not you. And Lord, help us to be faithful to walk in that calling. Use us for your glory and the upbuilding of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Missions Podcast is a ministry of ABWE. To get more, go to missionspodcast.com. While you're there, share the show with a friend and leave a positive rating and review. Join the family at missionspodcast.com slash support. Until next time, thank you for listening.